Hey everyone, Aaron Stewart, Data Access, Data Access Golf, the live show here on a Data Monday, celebrating the win of Dylan Fratelli uh, from South Africa. Uh, a great win, a great, um, a great story actually. I didn't know much about him, so I had the chance uh, as we put together this data for the show, kind of kind of jump in and, and learn a little bit about him. Kind of a cool journey, so. Look forward to chatting about, chatting about him really quick and getting into the data that mattered, kind of checking out to see how the year is. And uh, then we'll get into a little bit about the British Open as well. So let's get going. Welcome to Data Access Golf, your home for rapid golf improvement. And now, from the thin air of the Rocky Mountains, next on the number one tee, your host, Aaron Stewart. With the big win here at the John Deere Classic, obviously, John Deere is known for having a lot of first-time uh, winners. Jordan Smith being probably the most famous among them when he was 19. Uh, Steve Stricker has been there a lot and won a bunch of times. So one of the, I don't know, kind of one of the I don't know, kind of the down-home feel-good tournaments, I think. They do a great job raising money. Um, the course is always in great shape. Um, they had a, you know, they've got a jet there ready to go to take everybody who's qualified for the British Open over there. So that's amazing. That's really cool. Uh, anyway, just kind of a fun tournament. And it was wide open. You really didn't know what was going on. A couple quick observations, though, I thought was interesting. That Colin Mo um Motokami was right back in there again and has earned his card now. Uh, with the number of points that he's earned, he'll finish within the top 125 and he'll have his card next year. Uh, Matt Wolf obviously did that by winning last year. I mean, winning last week. So, And, and I, I had a little discussion about their two swings and which swing would you take um, for the rest of your career. And Collins is just a much better swing than Matt Wolf's. And much more consistent. And if you go look at their numbers this week, you'll see what I'm talking about. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about it. So anyway, so let's jump right in then and discuss this great win by Dylan. Um, he's been around a lot longer than people think he has. And uh, so I wanted to jump in and kind of get the discussion going on what he's doing. So I'm going to bring up my screen here and we'll uh, start talking about it. So what I wanted to kind of look at really quickly is... Just some brief history. I, I was interested when I went through and kind of read this up that, um, you know, Dylan won the Junior World Championships back in 2007. And um, big deal, right, for ages 15 to 17. So kind of, he's got the pedigree. He's been playing really good golf for quite some time. He's from South Africa, which is really interesting, too, that Retief Goosen won on the Champions Tour, also from South Africa. So the South Africans had a very good weekend for sure in men's golf. Uh, Dylan played at the University of Texas and he was the one that won the de decisive match there in 2002 won the one the, when they won the NCAA championship. So again, another feather in the cap. This pedigree is looking pretty impressive for sure. He turned pro right after that decisive putt, that victory, and then went over to the European Tour, which is pretty common for a lot of those that have you know, come to the United States and played golf collegiately, but live outside the United States. Um, they seem to gravitate towards the European tour um, more often than not. Uh, anyway, he struggled a little bit. He played on the European tour, did okay, kind of bounced around a little bit. But in 2013 to 14, you can see there, he dropped to 926 in the rankings. So he had some real struggles that he was dealing with in his game and his ranking showed it. He dropped quite a bit. Uh, then came back in and, and worked on his game. Kind of, there was quite a history and kind of bouncing back and forth on the Challenge Tour. But in 2017, there you can see that he um, was able to finish eighth in the Challenge Tour, which is essentially like the Corn Ferry Tour for the PGA Tour. It's kind of the the Junior Tour of the European Tour. So he earned his European Tour card with his world ranking points and some of the tournament results that he that he was able to achieve over here. On the PGA Tour, he qualified for the Web.com uh, finals last year and then picked up his card that way. I think he was 36th, I believe, in, um, in the rankings as he came out of the Web.com Tour, now the Corn Ferry Tour. And then, as we know, yesterday he won the John Deere Classic, gives him a couple of years of 
um, status on the PGA Tour. Um, he can play anything he wants. He can set up a schedule, makes it super, super convenient for him and his family and gives him some job security. And for a guy like this, you look at a, like a Matt Wolf who does it in three starts. And then you look at a guy like this and he's been bouncing around all over the world and trying to make it. This has got to be, I mean, as far as a, a really satisfying win for him to come all the way up through the ranks. There's just something about those guys that, um, I don't know. I'm just more impressed with. So really cool, cool stuff right there. Okay. So what did this win do for one Mr. Fratelli? Well, his world golf rankings, he was at 133rd all the way up to 92. So he breaks in the top 100 and then FedEx cup rankings. He was at 154th. It bumps him all the way up to 48th. So a huge jump there. I thought this was interesting too. At the end of 2018 though, he was ranked 76th in the world. So he had been trending really well and then it kind of struggled this year until he got this victory, but really great um, jumps there for sure. I wanted to do a little I wanted to do something a little differently since we're talking about World Golf rankings and FedEx Cup rankings. I wanted to start looking at both of those and looking at the top tens as we get to the towards the end of the year, just to kind of give us an idea of where everybody sits and how they how the how the two kind of correlate with each other. So I'm going to bring that screen up real quickly here. So so FedEx Cup season points, you can see there Matt Kuchar is still leading. He has for quite some time with Brooks Kepka, Roy McIlroy. Xander Shoffley right there, Gary Woodland, Patrick Cantlay, Dustin Johnson, Paul Casey, Justin Rose, and Ricky Fowler round out the top 10 here at the FedEx Cup. But if you jump over and look at the World Golf rankings, it's kind of interesting here. You've got, you know, Matt Kuchar nowhere there. So whatever Matt Kuchar has been doing over here to lead the FedEx Cup isn't really translating um, to the official World Golf rankings, which I thought was somewhat interesting. But you see Brooks Kepka, we get. Dustin Johnson, we've got him seventh at the FedEx Cup, second in the world here. He did have a European Tour victory this year down in, I don't know where it was, Abu Dhabi or something like that, I believe. You've got Rory McIlroy there. He's third, third in, in, in the uh, FedEx Cup as well. Justin Rose, ninth, but fourth in the world. Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods is nowhere on the FedEx Cup points. He just hasn't been playing very much. Bryson DeChambeau, again, not in the top 10 here. But he did have an international victory as well. Francisco Molinari, not here in the FedEx Cup, but he does bounce around and play both, as does John Rahm. John Rahm just got a victory, right, over there on the European Tour. And then Justin Thomas and Patrick Cantlay. We don't have a Justin Thomas in the FedEx Cup ranking points, but you've got Patrick Cantlay right there at 6th and then 10th. I was surprised to see that he was up at 10th in the official world golf ranking. So I think I'll just throw those in on Monday, just because when we talk about how the rankings change for our winner, we can quickly look to see what uh, the rest of the world's looking at as well. So, all right, what does, this is the consistency rating part of the show. And again, one of my favorites because I created it. So yeah, a little humble brag or not so humble brag. So uh, again, the, the idea behind this is I, I love to compare individuals to see how their how their consistency stacks up year to year with one another. And so it's a really great way to go in and kind of see this is consistent consistency for their entire career, which is super impressive. If you look at like a Tiger Woods there, he he's one that I have in um, in this scale as a legend, right? He's made over 90% of his cuts for his entire career, which is incredible. Um, anyway, so we kind of look at their ratings to see how they sort of fit in the hierarchy of consistency. And we can see here that uh, Dylan has played in 33 tour events and he's made 21 cuts. And that's an effective consistency rating of 64%, which puts him in the good category along with uh, gentlemen like the name of Kisner, McDowell, Pan, Palmer, Nah. Okay, so that's the kind of category of player he is over the course of his career. He fits in with those uh, gentlemen right there. Um, we've got legends here. I said it was Tiger Woods. He's the only one that's in that 90% tile. Um, but you've got some closing in on him uh, for sure. But you've got there in the elite, Kepka, McElroy, Molinari, DJ, Mickelson, Rose, and Cantley as far as uh, winners this year and, and tracking their consistency numbers. So kind of a cool stat there. Really, if you just take any player, if you're interested to see 
um, how they fit in over the course of their career, this is a great way to do it. It's, it's quick and easy. Just go to the PGATour.com uh, stats page and find how many events they've been in and find out how many cuts they've made and just divide the events into the cuts made and boom, you have a nice percentage there to figure out how consistent they've been over the course of their careers. All right, as far as the performance goes, the data that matters here, I need to get out of the way, don't I? Let me do this. Let me see if I can move myself here. Uh, there, I'll hang out with Dylan up there in the top there, right? I don't even know how to do it. Hey Dylan, what's up buddy? Oh, I gotta go back this way? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at these numbers here. I need to make these bigger somehow. I don't know how quite to do that, but if you can follow along with me really quick, essentially what we're looking at, these benchmark reviews, um, these are numbers that I created by looking at the PGA Tour stat numbers for 2018. And this is a way for us to compare our game against PGA Tour players and then kind of determine, and it gives us the ability to determine where our game is the weakest and what we need to work on. This was a fascinating one, I got to say. So you see I've got the categories broken up in driving accuracy, greens and regulation, sand saves, strokes gain putting, scrambling, and then putting. Okay, Strokes gain putting is really not part of it. It's just interesting because... Uh, so many of the tournaments are won because of really good putting that week. So it's fun to see what their strokes gained for the week was compared to their strokes gained for all of 2018 to kind of see how that works out. Uh, usually their putting's a lot better. Matt Wolf last week's putting was not. And we couldn't really compare it to anything, but his putting wasn't very good and he still got it done. His um, tee to green was pretty impressive. Well, at least his um, his approach shots were pretty impressive. Off the tee, he wasn't impressive. So... Okay, so driving accuracy. So for the tournament, Dylan averaged 79% um, hitting his fairways off the tee, which is, for 2018, he averaged 59%. So quite a bit better. 20 points better than what he averaged in 2018. Our benchmark for that driving accuracy is 55%. Some individuals who hit less than 55% of, um, of their fairways, Phil Mickelson, Tony Finau, Jimmy Walker, okay? Um, for the tournament then, so anything, if we are hitting less than 55% of our fairways, and we, obviously we have to be tracking them, and that's what I'm creating the app to do to quickly and easily track this, um, then we need to be working on our, our accuracy off the, off the tee, okay? In this particular case, um, no problem here for Dylan, right? 79% for the tournament and 59% for all of 2018. Um, above the 55%, not by a lot, but still within the green. And so we'd say, hey, go look for another area to work on your game because your game is tour quality, right? Just fine. All right, greens and regulation for the tournament, he averaged 78% greens and regulation. And, which is interesting, normally we see that a little bit higher than driving accuracy. But in this particular case, it didn't. And we'll see another number coming up here that will explain why it worked out for so well for him. But so greens and regulation, 78% for the week. He averaged 63% for um, 2018. And that's obviously 15 points lower. And that makes a big difference. And our, our benchmark for that particular category, greens and regulation, is 65%. He's two points lower than that. That would be an area of concern where uh, Dylan could work on that. For the tournament, he averaged well above that, and that helped him get the victory. He was above, he was above his averages for sure. Sand saves. Um, for this tournament, he made 67%, got up and down out of the sand 67% of the time. In 2018, he averaged 40% of the time. Our benchmark is 40% of the time. Our benchmark is 45% of the time, so he's five points below the benchmark, which is three points higher than this than, you know, greens and regulation. So right now we'd say, hey, probably work on those, uh, you know, work on that uh, sand game a little bit, okay? Strokes game putting, again, we don't really compare their 2018 numbers or say if it's good or bad. Essentially, um, a really good um, strokes game putting numbers like one, one, if you can pick up one per round, on the field, that's pretty solid putting, really good putting. He was negative in 2018. Uh, he lost almost point, point 0.4 strokes per round, so almost two round, two two strokes around to the field in putting. 
Uh, but for this particular tournament, he averaged one point, essentially nine. So almost two strokes. So he picked up, really, if you look at eight strokes on the field on the greens, which is obviously amazing and, and far better than he averaged in 2018. So nice job there. Scrambling. This one's really, this is amazing, uh, especially when you look at that. That's a 40 point difference between, he was 94% scrambling around, from around the green. 2018 averaged 54%. So you look at that the greens and regulation number and say, hey, that's a little lower than we'd normally see. He was 94% around the green. That's awesome. And he led the field in scrambling. So that's how he was able to get it done and play solid golf. If he missed the green, he still was able to get up and down for par. 94% of the time, that's incredible. So, And then we just look at these, these putting numbers just for kicks. Um, we don't necessarily keep track of these anymore for our benchmarks, but it is kind of nice to see where their games shake out. Um, we're now more about really working on that five foot and in, that circle, five foot and in circle around, and, uh, and then that will improve our game. So we spend all of our practice time on five footers and in. And then we, you know, a couple lag putts, chipping and, and, and sand games and all that's trying to get within that 10 foot circle of the hole because we know our five footers are so solid. But this is what's interesting here. If you look at this, um, from 20 to 25 feet, um, for the tr um, from 20 to 25 feet in 2018, we don't have any current stat numbers on that per tournament. Uh, Dylan averaged 15% which is pretty solid. Our benchmark from 20 to 25 feet was 9%. We don't keep track of it now, but so solid putter from 20 to 25 feet. But then look at this from 15 to 20 feet. He averaged, he averaged less than putts made from 20 to 25 feet. So he's got a real issue with 15 to 20 feet. Our benchmark is seven, was 17%. So we would say 15 to 20 footers for Dylan. We don't say that as amateurs because we don't have as much time as Dylan does to work on his game. Uh, 10 to 15 footers, right on our benchmark, 20%. So not like a super strong putter. So to see how well he putted this last week with 1.865 strokes gained per round is amazing. Um, his putter was on fire for him, not something that he would expect typically. This is the one that really concerns me, especially because I'm really promoting this idea of working on our five footers and in for amateurs, just making sure that if we have time to practice our putting, it's five footers and in. And we just make sure that we are so good at those that it's just a no brainer. We have absolutely no fear from five feet and in because we practice so much, you know, every moment we have, it's five footers and in. Well, if you look at here at Dylan's number, he made 71% of his five footers in 2018. Our benchmark, which is not like off the charts, was 80%. And those that make less than 80%, Ian Poulter, John Romb, Kevin Na, every one of them made more than 71%. So yeah, that's a five, five footers are a big deal for Dylan. He should join our, um, our little group and work on his five footers with us. Just focus on the five footers. Um, buddy, because those were by far the lowest compared to the benchmark in putting his five footers. They were the weakest part of his game based on our benchmark. So interesting stuff there. Definitely. We can see that uh, better driving accuracy, better greens and regulation, way better sand saves, way better putting, way better scrambling. That's what got it done this week. I mean, he just had an all, he, all around Really good tournament, and he bettered all his averages by quite some distance. So an amazing one there. You just have to shake, tip your cap, shake his hand, and go. So what does that mean for the money for, uh, for one Dylan, for Telly? Um, as we saw, he's, he's made 21 cuts, so we're going to take a look and see exactly what that means for him. So in the John Deere, the first prize pays one million bucks, just over a million, one million eighty thousand. Um, his total score was 263. Now, here's something that's odd. That's the fourth in a row, right, of 263. The last four tournaments have been won with the final score of 263. And before these four, there was only one other 263 by Dustin Johnson back in the day. So really strange to have four winning totals of 263 in a row. I mean, really, really crazy for sure, but interesting stuff. Okay, so John Deere paid out $1,080,000. The score was 
total score of 263 strokes. Uh, so Dylan made $270,000 per day, four days of work. He made $54,000 per hour, assuming a five hour round. And he made $4,106 per stroke, right? That 263 strokes. Uh, for his career now, he has made 1.8235 million bucks. Um, it's, yeah, one, one point, I didn't get a, a comment in there, did I? But anyway, he's made one point, I think, is this live? Oh, I'm going to fix it right now, folks. There you go. So he's made 1823537 bucks over the course of his career. That's with 21 cuts. So he averages $86,835 per cut. And just to give you an idea of where that sort of fits in, you can kind of look at the winners this year. So far, Tiger Woods leads the category with $367,000 per cut. Roy McIlroy there at $340,000 per cut. These numbers are insane. This is per cut, not victory. This is per cut. Uh, Dustin Johnson makes $293,000 per cut. Not victory, per cut. Uh, fourth in that, Justin Thomas, $274,000. And then Brooks Koepka has obviously been racing up the last few years. He makes $256,000 per cut. That's a lot of cashola. Now, anyway, very happy for Dylan for sure and um, excited to see how he does over at the British. I, I love to watch how they play, um, you know, in their next tournament after a win. Matt Wolf struggled a little bit. Um, and, and, and most seem to, right? That's kind of a big uh, matzo ball to get off your back. And so it changes things a little bit for sure. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to look at real quickly as well. And again, I think I'm just going to make them part of the weekly, just to kind of get an idea of, we're looking at these benchmarks. And so to bring them up to see what the year-to-date stats leaders are for these particular categories, I thought might be interesting. So driving accuracy percentage, you've got Ches Rizvi, what, he's hitting 75% of his fairways. Remember, our benchmark is 55%. And anyway, you've got Ryan Moore, Jim Furyk, Ryan Armour, and Hendrik Stenson. And Hendrik obviously uses that three wood most of the time. So they're leading in accuracy. And then greens and regulation, you've got Corey Connors, Justin Thomas, um, Johnson Wagner, who you haven't really heard a lot about um, this year, but he's played 53 rounds. But Charles Howe III which had a really good tournament. He's had a really great year. And then Matt Kuchar, obviously we've heard of him, but he's dropped. He went from third to fifth. Um, so yeah, um, Johnson Wagner, obviously, right? Went from seventh to third. So he had a really good week uh, there for sure. And then we'll look at sand saves and scrambling. Ernie Els, 66% out of the sand. Obviously our benchmark is 45%. And then Jimmy Walker down there at 62%. And then scrambling. I thought this was interesting. I did not expect to see Patrick Cantley there. I see him. I think of him as a, you know, a real kind of a, a bomber, ball striker kind of an individual. But there he is. He's leading in scrambling, 63%. That kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about with, with Dylan's victory. He was 97% for the week around the green scrambling. So you've got Patrick Cantley out there, 67%. Our benchmarks are 55% around the green, so you can kind of see how that fits in. Webb Simpson, Lucas Glover, Aaron Baddeley, and Jonathan Bird, right there at 65%. So that is it for this Data Monday. Thank you for joining me. A very big win for one. Dylan, we'll bring him back up here, won't we? One big victory for Dylan. Obviously really great for his world ranking and FedEx Cup ranking points. It's always cool to see somebody that's such a, uh, I guess... He's been around, right? I mean, he's worked for this a long time. So really cool to see him be able to pull that off and get the victory uh, for sure. Um, I thought that was great. Uh, really hats off to the John Deere Classic folks because it was an awesome tournament again. And it, it's always amazing to hear how they use that money to benefit so many people. The PGA Tour is just amazing, off the charts, great for helping other people and raising money. And you can't do anything but tip your cap to them and, and tell them, Thanks. It's, what, it's part of what makes golf such an amazing sport. It's the greatest sport in the world. Happy that we all get to play it together. Okay, coming up this week, we'll definitely jump into it tomorrow, but we've got the British Open. And yes, we are going to continue to call it the British Open. There were some arguments made uh, that I shouldn't, 
and I'll bring I'll talk about those tomorrow, but I'm not I'm not changing. The arguments were not good enough to budge me from my uh, position. Um, they used to call themselves the British Open. You don't just get to change stuff on us because you want to and because you're British. Right. So, I mean, if right, I mean, I don't know what, what would you call this the colonies forever, because that's what it used to be called. Not we can't call it the United States of America anymore. I don't know. Anyway, so we'll have a huge talk on that for sure. It's, uh, yeah, it'll be cool. It'll be fun to talk about. So until then, thank you for joining me. Better data always means better golf. Until next time, this is Aaron Stewart saying thank you. Hit it long, hit it straight, but keep it in the fair way. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Data Access Golf with Aaron Stewart. Check us out online at dataaccessgolf.com, and we'll see you on the next episode.